What I still haven't quite gotten to now, uh, yet, uh, which I will now, is um, the cross terms. So in some fancier force fields, um, you may have uh, so-called cross terms, which are not quite stretches, not quite bends. It's an interaction between stretches and bends or between different pairs of terms. Uh, so for example, in water, um, water, if I stretch the bonds, that can affect the bending angle and vice versa. Uh, so I can add a so-called stretch bend term to try to account for that. Uh, and in fact, uh, if I strongly bend water, it tends to make the bond lengths get a little more longer. So I'll get a stretched OH bond if I have a strongly bent water molecule, and that can be accounted for with something like equation 23. And you can see that basically it, it literally is a cross term where I'm taking an angle deformation and multiplying it by a bond stretch deformation. Um, so this is one way to do this. You could have stretch, stretch, cross terms, bend, bends, cross terms, stretch, torsion, cross terms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, typically, the most popular force fields don't have any of these. You just neglect them. But some of the force fields, like MM4, do include some of these cross terms. Okay, so now we've talked a lot about the functional forms in these various force fields. And I'd now like to turn our attention to how do I get the parameters that go into these? Because I need a lot of parameters like bond stretch force constants K2 and uh, uh, bending angle uh, force constants. And um, if I'm doing higher terms in the Taylor series, I need those. I need the Fourier constants for the torsional angles. Where do all these things come from? Um, well, let's think first off about how many of these there are. So suppose I only had 30 different atom types, and we know there are actually much more, but suppose there were 30 atom types. Um, well, if I had um, um, all the, uh, the just bond terms, then I would need each atom times each other atom, and I'd have 30 squared divided by two uh, stretching constants. Uh, which is kind of a lot, but, you know, maybe under control. Um, but then think about the torsional parameters. So if you think about torsion, A, B, C, D, uh, and I had 30 atoms that could occur at each location, A, B, C, and D. Uh, now if I go backwards, D, C, B, and A is the same as A, B, C, and D. I don't need different constants for that, so I could divide by 2. But I'd still have 30 to the 4th divided by 2 torsional parameters for each... Uh, v, A, B, C, D, sub N. And then if uh, N is up to three, then I need, you know, three of those. Um, so that would be something like 1.2 million possible torsional parameters, which is a heck of a lot of parameters. And again, that's not even really all the ones I would need. Um, how do I avoid this? Well, um, you can think carefully and say, you know what? It's very unusual that I would have, say, oxygen bonded to oxygen, bonded to oxygen, bonded to oxygen. So let's not worry about that one. And there are many other chemical situations that just don't really come up in standard organic chemistry. So we can pare down a lot of these uh, and, in fact, go way the heck down to 2,466 most useful torsional parameters in MM2, which is much more manageable. It's still a lot of parameters. Um, the downside to this, of course, is that if I had some weird bonding situation uh, that uh, the folks who invented MM2 didn't think about, then I just won't have the parameters I need to run my simulation, and the simulation simply won't run. And that, unfortunately, is a common problem with force field methods. Um, and uh, in fact, it, it is one of the most frustrating things about trying to use force field approaches. You find parameters are not available for that. So that's really unfortunate. All right, so now let's talk about how accurate these approaches can be. And let's start with talking about heats of formation. So as you may remember from freshman chem, heat of formation is the energy or uh, heat content uh, of some substance relative 
to its constituent atoms in their so-called standard state. Okay, um, and heats of formation, are, of course, are very useful for a lot of things. Uh, it allows you, for example, to compare the energy of two different conformers of a molecule, or even two different molecules to each other. Um, bond energy schemes are a simple way to quickly estimate the heat of formation of a molecule. All you do is you look at all the kind of bonds in a molecule, like so many CH bonds, so many CC double bonds, so many CC single bonds, etc. You look up a table, you find CH, CC double bond, CC single bond, and each of those has a tabulated typical heat of formation, then you add those up, and then that gives you an estimate. The problem is that only works if the system doesn't exhibit any strain, because the bond energies don't know anything about a strain. Um, it would work a lot better if you had some way to correct this bond energy scheme with an estimate of the additional enthalpy due to the strain of the molecule. And that's exactly what you can get with molecular mechanics. It tells you what the energy of a molecule is as a function of its conformation, and so that will tell you how strained it is or not. Um, so um, in molecular mechanics, we compute the uh, strain energy and then add it to these bond increments to get an uh, estimate of delta HF. Uh, the bare molecular mechanics energy that you compute with these programs is actually not so useful um, for comparing two different molecules because there's no common frame of reference. Delta H has a common frame of reference, which is all the elements in their standard state. So that gives you, you know, a reference value. But um, in molecular mechanics, the strain of this molecule versus the strain of that molecule just tells you which molecule has more strain, but it doesn't say anything about the the true energy difference between those because you don't know anything about the energy of the individual um, bonds in terms of their heats of formation from the standard state. So you're missing, a, uh, you have a missing link if you're trying to compare a molecular mechanics of molecule A versus molecular mechanics energy of molecule B. They're just not comparable quantities. All you could say is which one's more strained than the other. But if you add these bond energy increments for the enthalpy, then you can get delta HF estimates, and then you can compare those two things to each other. So let's ask how accurate these heats of formation are. Now you should add some various small corrections to these. There are so-called population increments to correct for the fact that you might have low-lying conformers, which have uh, fractional occupation uh, of those uh, a lot of times those are just ignored. Um, torsional increments, if I have a torsional potential with a really shallow potential, I should make a thermodynamic correction for that. Sometimes those are ignored. Uh, corrections for low barriers besides methyl rotations. Usually methyl rotations are already included in the bond uh, increment or group increment scheme. It knows you've got a methyl group and it knows it rotates, so there's already some correction for the fact that it can freely rotate. But if there are other rotations that are low in energy, those are not necessarily included. So those are uh, small corrections that probably could be included and often aren't. Um, but with those as caveats, let's look at the performance of MM2 for some typical molecules and see how accurate delta HF is. And uh, we see that for hydrocarbons, the average error in delta HF is only 0.42 kilocalories per mole over this particular test set, which is really great the, for a, a, a heat of formation, which might be 100 kcal, 200 kcal. This kind of error is a very, very tiny error. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that molecular mechanics methods were parameterized for um, small molecule hydrocarbons that are similar to the ones that are tested here. Um, other functional groups have slightly bigger errors. You notice aromatic amines, for example, have much bigger errors. So your error will be smaller or bigger depending on how normal or routine the molecule is or how similar it is to the molecules that were studied when the parameters were developed. 
and the more exotic the molecule, the less likely it factored into uh, the parameters that were developed and the more likely the errors would be higher. But you can see that you can, in auspicious circumstances or normal circumstances where boring molecules are playing a role, get um, sub kilocalorie per mole um, accuracy in heat formation, which is really, really, really good. Let me uh, uh, make a couple categories of molecular mechanics methods. These are the ones uh, Jensen makes in his textbook. Uh, class one methods are gonna be ones where you have some of those higher order terms like cubic and quartic terms in the first field and sometimes in cross terms. So things like uh, MM4 or EFF or CFF, those are these uh, higher accuracy force fields. Um, class two would be ones that don't include those higher terms. Um, so they're gonna be more popular and more appropriate for larger molecules like proteins. Uh, and those would be things like uh, amber and charm and uh, so on. Let me wrap up this discussion of force fields to mention sometimes force fields are combined with quantum mechanics uh, in what you might call hybrids of force field methods and electronic structure methods. And these most often go under the label of QMMM, quantum mechanics slash molecular mechanics hybrids. Um, there the idea is you take an interesting part of the molecule. Maybe there's some um, interesting chemistry happening at uh, some metal center inside a protein. That you might treat with quantum mechanics because it's hard to treat metals or reactions with uh, force fields sometimes. But then the rest of the protein is just kind of hanging out, not doing a lot, and their force fields might be perfectly adequate. So these kind of QMMM approaches are very popular in a lot of context um, in uh, materials or uh, biomolecules where you can easily carve out one part that's uh, more interesting or tougher to model and then the rest that just kind of provides an environment. Um, another example of this is uh, K.G. Morikuma's onion methods, which I'll say something about in a second. But generally speaking, these QMMM approaches write down the energy as a quantum mechanics energy for the part that you described was important with quantum mechanics, uh, a molecular mechanics energy for the surrounding uh, part of the system, and then there's a cross term, a QMMM cross term, that has to do with the interaction of the QM region with the MM region. And there are various ways to handle that QMMM interaction energy. The first one, the simplest one, is so-called mechanical embedding. And when you do that, you include the bonded and the steric interactions between the QMMM regions and uh, maybe even assign partial charges to the QM atoms, um, but that's pretty much it, okay? Um, if you do electronic embedding, this is a more sophisticated approach, you also add partial charges on the MM atoms when you do the QM computation. So you've got a quantum mechanics region, you do a QM calculation, but that QM calculation sees point charges around it due to the MM atoms, and that uh, polarizes the distribution of electrons inside that QM region. Polarizable embedding is the next level up in the accuracy ladder. That's one where you allow the QM atoms to polarize the MM region. Now you can only do this if you're using a polarizable force field. So charm and amber, forget about it unless they're polarizable versions of those. But if you have a polarizable force field, then the MM region sees the QM electron distribution and then its electrons or, or at least its models of the electron distribution through the polarization term uh, responds to that. Um, that's kind of the different categories of how to handle this QMMM interaction. Um, if the QMMM boundary cuts through some covalent bonds, then um, you have a lot of technical details of how to handle this, but commonly used what's called our link atoms which basically, often they're just hydrogen atoms, 
that cap off the uh, rest of the part of the system that you deleted. So if I'm doing the QM calculation and I'm cutting through a carbon-carbon bond between my QM region and my MM region, a lot of times um, that molecular mechanics carbon I'll replace with a hydrogen when I'm doing the QM calculation, for example. And there's a lot of papers on fine details of exactly how to handle this. Uh, finally, let me mention Keiji Murakuma's onion approach. Sounds like onion, but not quite, and so then M. Uh, this uh, stands for our own in-layered integrated molecular orbital and molecular mechanics method. It's a, it's a similar approach in spirit. The details are different. What you do basically is you're trying to guess what would happen if I had the real system and I modeled it at a high level, like quantum mechanics. I can't afford to actually do that calculation. So what do I do instead? I do a low level calculation on the entire system. So that's the energy of the low level for the real system. Then I do a high level calculation on the model system. So maybe I do some decent quantum mechanics treatment on some model system that's smaller. Um, and I've done a low level calculation on the whole thing. Now I've double counted because that most interesting region, I did a high level calculation on it and I also included that when I did the low level calculation on the entire thing. And I don't want to double count. So I need to subtract the low level calculation on the model system to, so that then each part is only computed once. And by cutting things off and capping and doing some fine details I'm glossing over, it's essentially just three calculations as you can see. And I add and subtract and I get an estimate of what would have happened if I could have done the high level calculation on the real system. It's a nice way to not neglect the effect of the environment, which is so often done in a purely quantum mechanical approach. Um, and you can jazz this up. You can have multiple layers and all kinds of things. Uh, originally, this approach just used mechanical embedding for the QM interface, but uh, it was generalized to allow electronic embedding as well, which is an improvement for sure. Um, you could even do something like this uh, with two quantum mechanical approaches if you wanted. You could have a high level quantum mechanics like couple cluster and a low level quantum mechanics uh, like some cheap DFT and uh, you would still use this general set of uh, 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 three calculations to estimate the one calculation. All right, that's my brief overview of molecular mechanics and a little uh, bit of QMMM. Um, and I hope this is a useful introduction and uh, helps you have a little bit better grasp about what's going on when people are doing calculations with popular tools like Charm and Amber. All right, let's see what happened to Onyx. Yes, yeah, she's woken up. She's decided to check out my microphone and my computer. So that's pretty good. She's inspired to do some of her own calculation. Impressive. I hope this has been useful, and I will see you all again next time.